a lot of the Duffy universe requires you to just go, okay, <laughs> because if you start asking questions, you'll be like, wait, Duffy and Shelly Mae aren't dating. They're just friends. And then you're like, they were truly like, like man created from rib. Like these two beings are meant to be together, but they're just friends. Like who will they find love with? It's, it's too much. It's too much to handle. So yeah, essentially Duffy's origin story is bizarro. It just doesn't, I think there's like two versions of his origin story too, which is like so much to handle. That is journalist Carly Wiesel, who's back to talk about so many important topics it's going to be fun. You're listening to the Tomorrow Society Podcast. Thanks for joining me here on episode 117 of the Tomorrow Society podcast. I'm your host, Dan Heaton. It's October. How did that happen? In one sense, this year has seemed like the longest year ever, but in another, I go, we're going to blink and we're going to be in 2021. Now, how the year will be, we'll see, but it's definitely an unprecedented time, you know, and that's where even for theme parks... There are so many different moving parts. You have a situation where you have parks that are open in Florida, like Walt Disney World and Universal, and then Disneyland is still not currently open, and everything in between. So there's a lot to cover, and yet it also feels a little inconsequential given everything going on in the world, but it's still important because a lot of us are really into theme parks and have an interest in what happens there. But if you're like me and you haven't gone to Disney World, you're not planning to go, but yet are still very interested in the industry and what's happening, it's an interesting time because I'm very conflicted where I think, how much should I get concerned with a new attraction or something happening at the parks when right now I'm not going to go until either the cases are way down or there's a vaccine? That's the reason I wanted to talk with Carly Weisel. She did go in July and has posted just some amazing updates about that experience and also about the news since that point on Instagram, on Twitter. And also she wrote a really interesting article on Vox about going there, but also a lot of research and talking to fans and experts and just a really good article that is worth reading. It came out in July, but it still totally applies now. And so I thought it'd be great to talk with her once again. She was on the podcast in January where we talked about her background, had a fun conversation. And who knew in January what it would be like now? But if you haven't, you should definitely check out her writing. She also started a cool podcast called Very Musing, where she it's a very well-produced show, and I mean that in the best way possible, where she's covering a specific topic and talking with a lot of experts, but also having fun with it. So it's kind of a mix of information, but also just just a fun listen. And right now, it's refreshing to have some shows that, you know, cover theme parks, do it in a fun way, and just have a different perspective and approach that is not just about the news or even what I'm doing with interviews and history and that side of it. Completely different perspective and totally fitting of what Carly does. And I wanted to, again, briefly mention something I talked about on the last show. I'm going to be doing a listener Q&A episode, so I would love to respond to your questions. They can be about what's going on right now, news from the parks, upcoming expansions that are still happening, what I think about something to do with history, something about this show, about me. Really any topic, even if it's just sort of related to Disney and theme parks, I will take a shot at answering. I'm going to do the show soon, but I'm not sure how soon because I want to give you time to submit your questions. So, of course, shoot me an email, dan at tomorrowsociety.com or send me a message on social media, of course, at Tomorrow Society. Send me your questions, record something, 
just shoot me a note. It'll be really fun. And I'm looking forward to answering a bunch of your questions in the future. So my introduction made this sound a bit dour, and it's not that way at all. Carly and I still have a lot of fun topics. You heard the intro where she's talking about Duffy. I made sure in the show also to have a segment where I just asked her a lot of various questions that made sure we had a lot of fun. And we also talk about the podcast, so there's a lot to cover. I should also mention we do make a reference to the Jurassic World Velocicoaster which had not been announced when we recorded this. So we make a joke about that. And I know since that time, Universal has given the name and said that it will be coming out in summer 2021. So, you know, I still think the joke is funny, even if Universal has finally announced that massive coaster that's been built for so long. Thank you, Universal, for finally acknowledging what we all already knew. Let's dive in. Here is Carly Weisel. Well, I am thrilled to once again be talking with a theme park journalist who has reported on theme parks for travel and leisure, Eater, GQ, so much more. She also has written a weekly column for Sci-Fi. She is a co-author of the DK Eyewitness Florida 2020 and is also the host of the new podcast, Very Amusing, with Carly Weisel, which is amazing. And of course, it is Carly Weisel. Carly, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. Oh my God. Well, this is exactly why I would, because I want to record that minute that you just said and like use it to play for other people as I enter a room. Uh, Everything you say is wonderful and you were so complimentary. Oh my God. I'm happy to be here. Well, I think what I covered was like about 20%, 10% of what you've done. So I still don't feel like I gave it the full (laughs) details, but you know, I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it up front, you know? So there's a lot you've done. So it's great. You've made me sound so much less lazy than I feel. (laughs) Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you on that one. So speaking of that, you know, we talked in January The world was wonderful. We talked about going to theme parks. Everything was great. And now I feel like it's eight months later. Totally different. So I'm just curious up front. How are things going for you, given how the world is and theme parks are and everything? Oh, well, considering within like the last 48 hours, it was a blizzard and then all the snow disappeared. And my brain a few minutes ago thought it was October. Things are going as good as they could. (laughs) Like I, uh, my brain is a mishmash. I don't know what's going on. Most days covering the parks is now like a semi-political issue. Everything has changed. It's very intense, but I'd say for the most part, I'm at least in somewhat good spirits. Well, that's good to hear. So, you know, like I mentioned, you're a journalist who covers theme parks yet a lot of theme parks aren't open. So how do you, I know Disney World's open in a lot of Florida, but things like, how do you cover the news compared to how you used to? How much has it changed? Very much. (laughs) So before it was all happy, there was no like threat of virus underlying in our Disney and Universal coverage. Now, even writing anything about quite literally anything that's happening at the theme parks, there are a lot of factors that you need to add in to responsibly report. Like you have to keep in mind the guest experience, the employee experience, what uh, COVID numbers are like in Florida or California at that time, kind of what it, what are the unemployment realities right now, which are things that I've never had to report on as part of being like, yum, cotton candy is good. So it's gotten a lot heavier. And also, I think because of that, there isn't really that much work right now. Um, the timing worked out spectacularly for me because I'm working on my own project. And if I was as busy as I was at the top of the year, I would be pulling my hair out. But it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty bleak. Because even just being like, there is this cool new sipper, you I feel like you also have to have that running monologue in your head of like, okay, but like, if you talk about this cool thing, then that means that you're encouraging people to go to the parks, perhaps. And like, what are the implications of that? And on and on and on. Yeah, that it's I can't imagine doing that. Because I even think about, you know, just me personally, and what I'm thinking about the parks and like getting excited for something new and then going, yeah, but when are we going to go to that? Like, how, when are we going to actually see Avengers Campus or something? It's all out of whack. And I can imagine it's really challenging. But you mentioned a project. And I know that <laughs> you really, you know, I'm pulling us out of it right now. But you released 
a really cool podcast that as of this recording, I believe has either three or four episodes. I'm trying to remember, but it's called very amusing. Like I mentioned with Carly Weisel. And I think it's a lot of fun and also really fits with your personality. And it's kind of different, which is hard to do in the Disney podcast world. So I'm curious how you got interested in hosting a podcast and doing this project. Oh, well, first of all, thank you very much. Again, um, you say such nice things. And I just as a Midwesterner want to melt and be like, I don't know how to respond. I actually I've been working on it, trying to get it together for about a year at this point. Um, It took a long time to get it off the ground. But it's strange because I completely changed the entire season one lineup once all of this happened. But it's still the format that I put in place happened to work completely fine for right now, which is, was very surprising. But essentially, Very Amusing is all of the theme park stories that I've been interested in or curious about or have wanted to tell and haven't been able to just because they don't fit a magazine I write for or, or it's something that an editor would be like, mm, I don't think anyone cares about this. <laughs> so it's like really, really nice to be reporting on stuff that's almost exclusively for theme park fans, which is something I've never really gotten the opportunity to do before. Right, because a lot of times if you're writing for a big publication, you have to think about it in terms of your audience is someone who might not know much about it or knows, you know, knows a little bit about the parks where this is like, you know, you're talking about like, you know, what's under the carousel of progress or something very specific, (laughs) which I enjoy because as somebody personally who, you know, knows has spent a little time thinking about theme parks it's um it's a cool setup and i i like the idea of it and i also like the idea that you said you spent so much time planning because i think back to my early episodes of this show and i'm like oh oh i don't even want to listen to them they're good your show seems so fully formed so how did you how did you make that happen um i'm very type a (laughs) i think that informs a lot of it because it was a project that i'm doing in collaboration with Acast and um ICM is an agency that approached a cast about the podcast. So there's been like a lot of hands in it just in terms of getting it solidified. But because I know there's like a a vague, a non-authority figure, but like someone on an email chain where if I just release a stinker of an episode, I might get an email. So like the fear of authority, I think is why it's so like structured (laughs) and probably why I spend all my time on it. But uh, I I love it. It's been really fun. I I enjoy it a lot. I I don't know why I put so much time in. Like I should be phoning it in much more just so I can like have a weekend, which I haven't had since it began. But I can't help myself. I just can't help myself because for so long, you know, I the way I usually approach a lot of my news stories. So not like deep reported features, but just things that are like top level, surface level, new things at Disney or Universal stories. I always approach it as like, will someone reading this on the toilet understand? Because like fra- that's how a lot of people end up on these stories is like they're pooping and they're on Apple News. Like it's just the reality of journalism in 2020. <laughs> so I always think like, is there enough context in here where if you don't know what's going on, you wind up on this on Apple News, will you understand what park I'm talking about, what state, what resort, what attraction, et cetera. So it's just been so fun to talk about things and not have to be like, well, Carousel of Progress is in an attraction that blah, 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 blah. Um, and have to give that context to be able to just kind of roll with it has been fun. And that's kind of why I've spent all my time on it. Oh, yeah, I can understand that where I never think about, you know, you would have to basically with any sometimes you have to explain, OK, Disney World is the resort and Epcot is the park and kind of get into that level where on a podcast like this, you're able to just enjoy it. And one part of it you've done, which I can't imagine you talked about work doing that, which is the churros phone number <laughs> where it's not about phone calls about churros. It's a, <laughs> it's about just people calling in with their thoughts about the topics or your mom calls and everything. So how did you decide to do that and how much work is involved with that line? I mean, I've heard it on a few other podcasts before that they had hotlines. Um, I mean, I have to credit who weekly, which is my favorite non Disney podcast. They, they just talk about dumb celebrity gossip, but do it in a really fun way. And they have so many calls about things. They have a whole episode. And I thought like, that's such a great way to communicate with Disney fans because I find DMs to be somewhat overwhelming. Um, On Twitter, if you're honestly, if you're not signed into Twitter every hour, you miss something. 
So having people call in and have like a place for them to express these questions or concerns or thoughts or opinions that they've never been able to like send to the media <laughs> to be like, can you please investigate a ride ghost? Like that's, that's something that was on this week's episode. I think it's been like a wonderful two way street because we're all kind of getting what we want out of it. Because as a reporter, like I treat the calls very seriously, um, like truly emailed multiple people to be like, can the Walt Disney archives confirm if Goofy is a dog or a cow? So I tend to be very newsy about it. And I, I really genuinely love getting these answers because people have been wondering these things. And it's like, if I put in an hour or two of work, I can get it done. And I love that. Yeah. And I think about, too, you talked about all the work you're putting into it. When somebody asks a question and you go down that road to figure out, and I always thought Goofy was a dog. I don't really understand this now, this question. <laughs> so the whole thing is a little confusing to me. But regardless, I think those are fun topics and it makes it more interactive rather than you're just putting things out in the world. Because I found even sometimes it's like you want to hear from people about what they think. And that's not always easy to do when you're doing a podcast. Yeah. And because it is uh, so reported and we're only going to have probably two or maybe three full interview episodes each season. So a lot of it is just me monologuing and then cutting in interviews here and there with other people. So I felt like it would be a really nice way to maybe break up this noise <laughs> and like have something else in there. And also like, I just love, I love being available. I, I love the calls. Keep them coming. They're so great. Yeah. Especially now that like you have episodes where you're responding, people are just going to keep calling in and um, that's going to be fun, I'm sure. But you mentioned interviews. I, I really enjoyed the one with, with Paul Shear, which I thought, you know, him kind of giving his opinions on attractions was, was very entertaining. <laughs> he's wrong about Navi River Journey. He's so Ooh, wrong. I believe, uh, I believe he's very <laughs> correct. Uh, I, if that was a place to eat a sandwich, which you don't get, in Pandora, I'd be fine with it. Well, of course, if that was the case, I would love it even more. But um, I'm curious, you know, you also talked to AJ Wolf and Stacy from the Must Do's videos. <laughs> yes. um, how much fun has it been to kind of do these interviews and with a variety of different types of people? They've all been very fun, except for Stacy, because I was so nervous. I truly was very nervous, which does not happen because talking to people is my literal job. <laughs> and like an hour before interviewing Stacy, I was like, Oh my God, like it's like Stacy is going to be in my computer screen, like on a zoom with Stacy is going to be on a zoom with me. Like it just was so hard for me to comprehend. But beyond that, I mean, she was an absolute joy and I um, would love to be her best friend. I'm obsessed with her even more than I was before the podcast after talking to her. But for the most part, they've been fun. And it's also nice to see people's faces because I I've been doing some of them on video and I'll like see a friend I haven't seen in months and be like, Oh my God. Hi. Remember we used to be at Disney world every six to eight weeks together. Like, Oh, you exist. Show me around your house. It's been fun. But yeah, for the most part, it's, uh, it's not going to be as interviewee. Mostly we have, uh, the Paul Shear interview was part of a hidden Mickey's segment, which is like someone who you don't expect to be a Disney fan is, and there's really not that many of them. <laughs> so we're going to we're going to keep those limited, I think. Yeah, because we know about like, you know, there's Neil Patrick Harris and Drew Carey and John Stamos or whatever. But I couldn't tell you I would not have told you that Paul Shear was like a big Disney fan. So that, that was fun to hear. So you talked about, you know, what we've done, you've done so far and how you planned it out. Kind of where do you want to take it in the future? I know you're kind of doing seasons which is very smart to someone that just does shows forever and ever and ever. <laughs> you know, I found that that's, that seems like a good idea, but what do you want to do with it in the future? Uh, I definitely want to have some themed seasons. I, I definitely don't think I will ever do anything as in depth as what Karina Longworth does with, you must remember this, but I do love how she has seasons that are completely independent of each other yeah. and some that focus on one specific thing. So if that opportunity approaches, I mean, that would be perfect to do maybe like six to eight episodes about one specific subject. But the thing is, like, I understand that there are so many people in this community who do such a fantastic job. That's why I barely even cover news on the podcast. I don't really plan on doing anything historical because I think so many people are already doing incredible things in that space where I'm like, 
you got it on lock. Like, I don't even want, I don't even want to go near this. Like, I just want to see your stuff and then move along with my day. So it definitely has to be the right fit. But I, for season two, I would like to cast my gaze somewhat more international, I'll say. Yeah. And that's, that's an area too. Like you mentioned, that's something I've run into too, where it's like, you know, I don't live in Orlando or California, you know, right there where like some people are like, doing news and they're in the parks every day and reporting on the latest popcorn bucket or latest. And I'm not picking on them. I'm saying that it's great that they can be so detailed, but you got to kind of find that, that spot. And I think you have so far though. It's, um, it's been good. Thank you. Yeah. It's like the weird cross section between a very obsessive reporter and someone who spends all of their time online all day. (laughs) So it's like that cross section I don't think has been fully tapped into. So I'm, I'm glad to be resting there, but like, yeah, there's, there's not a chance I'm taking a stab at news when like the Diz has a whole round table or like Alicia Stella knows everything about universal. (laughs) Like I'm not touching these things. I'm just going to go to them and be like, they're the best send people there and try to figure out my own little lane. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're they're so on top of it. All right. Well, speaking of just going to the parks, I know that, you know, Disney World, of course, reopened in July and some of the other Orlando parks had opened earlier. And I know that you were able to go and visit and you wrote a really good article for Vox about it. And I was curious just going back to that time, which, again, feels like a long time ago, but back in the ancient times of July. Um, (laughs) So before you went, I was just curious, what was your kind of thought process about it? Like um, how you felt about just going to the parks, given that they were opening still during a pandemic? (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to go with a very not great. Um, I was real stressed, like to the point where I had set myself up where I could pull a trigger at any point and be like, I'm out. Like, this is it. I'm not doing this. Like, I can't do this. Uh, because like the caseload just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger leading up to the time I was flying into Florida. And like, I knew that, like I knew from friends who live in Orlando and from people who work in the parks that like, yeah, it was intense, but Disney had all these things in place. Like it was going to be okay. Well, okay. Asterisk. But I, I did end up going. And the reason I went was because I really, really wanted to tell a reported news story. It was really important to me to have something framed like a big news piece. Not, not like, here's what Disney's doing. Here's like the seven to 10 things that they're taking, the precautions they're taking an essay of what it was like. I really, really wanted to be able to share with people who are, who have like that morbid curiosity about what's happening at Disney world, especially at a time like this, while also jamming enough information in there where they would walk away knowing the full scope of everything happening in Florida. Because I think the story isn't as narrow as Disney World's opening. I really wanted to flesh it out and be like, what is it like for an employee? How do the employees feel? Are the employees healthy? Like, what is unemployment like for the people who aren't back? How many people aren't back? Things like that. I went because I knew that story needed to be told. And I was like, I I just had like a I don't like an over I had like an all-consuming need to tell that story, which involved me to do that responsibly going to Florida. So I went for nine, nine or 10 days. Uh, I wanted to give myself extra room in case I wanted to, in case I got there and left a park, which ended up happening once. So I'm glad I booked all those days. But uh, it was like just enough time to kind of see what the full first week of opening was like. And then I spent a few hours at Universal to be able to see what it was like there as well. Yeah, I mean, it's such a complicated issue because, you know, it's easy for me to say, oh, well, should they be open or closed or whatever? But then you think about, like you mentioned, people with jobs and the business side of it and everyone not having work and then just the companies surviving. I mean, I don't know if that's the case with Disney, but in general, it's just it's very tricky. But um, but I'm, I'm glad you got to go there because you know, regardless of the stress, I'm not glad about that. But basically, (laughs) you know, that you're able to report on that. So I'm curious just to know, every most things I've seen, it seems like to the best of their ability, Disney is trying to do a good job and keep things as clean as they can and keep people separate. And, you know, they're trying to be responsible. And I haven't seen that case with certain, I'm not even talking about Orlando, just amusement parks, regional parks, whatever. But from your experience, what was it like to actually be there in the parks? Well, it was really unique when we were there because it was opening day, opening week. So everyone who worked there was still kind of getting used to it. Everyone who was there 
had more than likely not been in a crowd, like losing that term, using that term loosely, like a large place with many people, even if they are spread out, like no one had been in that situation in months. And then like a lot of it was affected by the fact that you knew this virus was peaking at that exact moment in that exact city. It like, or like in that region, in that state. So a lot of it was just like, it's just layers of, confusion because you, you know, you go from being in your house for what, three or four months and then you go and it's like, Oh, I'm back at that place that I used to go to all the time. And all the people are here because everyone who is kind of in the biz was there for the opening. So it was just so bizarre to be like, I'm outside of my house and I'm in another state and I flew here and like, there's Lentesta. Like (laughs) it was just so much to comprehend. But in terms of the new safety procedures, you get used to them so quickly. Even now, like my brain doesn't understand the parks before this time that people just didn't wear masks and like touched everything. It just seems weird, but it, it kind of, it felt pretty usual after a while. And I think that uh, I, I haven't been back since. I'll probably go back eventually at some point if I have to for work. But yeah, it was it was really interesting because it seems like everything's running. I don't want to use the word smoothly to imply it wasn't running smoothly before, but it seems like it's clockwork now. Like everyone kind of knows the positions, knows the roles, something like Labor Day weekend where there were more people at Universal Orlando Resort, things like that. Like that's a new thing that hadn't happened before, but it seems like almost every day, like it's, it's a process now and people are somewhat used to it. I can't imagine too, like you mentioned, because I think about me, like I go somewhere where I, even if I go inside somewhere to pick up food for two seconds, I'm like, what is, this is so weird. I, I'm not inside buildings and stuff and all that. And to do it at Disney world to another scale, I feel like I would be so stressed out the whole time. But I think I would hope that wasn't the case, but were you able were there times <laughs> where you were able to just kind of, I wouldn't even say, I know you were working, so, but were you able to appreciate the parks or just kind of have, enjoy it? Or was that always still kind of hanging in the background, the whole thing? Yeah. Well, I was, most of my reporting was being done before a little during and after, um, the portion of me being there was mostly just to know what it was like and to be on the ground and to like observe different things and to get questions answered because I couldn't get any questions answered the way that you found out they clean the ride vehicles, the frequency, how many people are loaded, how they load groups like you had to see that firsthand. So that's the type of stuff I was doing, which is kind of the way I visit the parks regularly because I'm kind of always working on something. So I was basically in the parks like a park goer, but just asking more questions (laughs) than the regular guest, I suppose. So it wasn't it was it was more overwhelming to be like, I really want to eat. And I I just didn't feel comfortable at that time because of the caseload in the state. Really, Uh, I didn't really feel comfortable doing a lot of things. So I ate some meals in my car. I, I went there with a full plan. I mean, like a hotel process. I got groceries and I ate a lot of meals in my room. Like I really had it laid out so that I didn't have to be as stressed when I was there. But you know, I like got fast food the night I flew in and nobody in there was wearing a mask. And I was like, I'm going to die from this chicken nugget. (laughs) So, but beyond that, like I over prepared and I think I ended up by doing that I was prepared. Well, right. Because, you know, in one sense, it's like, oh, man, all that preparation had to be stressful ever. But if you hadn't prepared at all, then you would be there'd be a different level of stress or anxiety or whatever. But I can't imagine. I think I just keep saying that I can't imagine it. But it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, not having info because I in your article, you talk about how Disney's PR was mostly just referring to the Disney Parks blog and everything. I mean, has that, I don't know if you've had to get a lot of info more recently, but I mean, has that changed at all since July? Like, are they giving more information out in a, like a way that's more transparent? It's hard to tell because I think all of the information is out. We'll see what happens when, I mean, not if, when, when Disneyland eventually reopens, we'll see if that happens again. But it seems like any question that had been asked has been answered one way or another. So I'm not really sure. It just, cause at this point, any question I would have, we already, we already know, like, how are they cleaning? How are they pushing people through? How are they doing this? How are they doing that? So I'm not sure. Well, you mentioned Disneyland possibly opening sometime soon. I mean, who knows the way things go by the time this podcast comes out, it might've been announced, but you know, <laughs> just given everything, well, I mean, 
notwithstanding everything in California right now with fires and, and everything else. But given what's going on with the pandemic and just everything you've learned, what do you think about it? Or even when do you think it might happen? I'm just curious to get your thoughts in general, however you want to present it on Disneyland possibly reopening. So I have no intel on specific date, but I keep saying October 15th because if I'm right, I'm going to look like a genius. <laughs> <laughs> so like, who like, mm, eh, no idea. But if it is that date, I'm going to look so smart. So take that with a grain of salt. But in terms of like realistic approaches, uh, I think that the things are kind of lining up to a place where I could see them making an announcement. Um, I'm sure nobody wants what happened with Orlando to happen in California where they make an announcement. Everything is tracking great. And then things change in the time between the announcement and the opening. So I'm sure they're going to be probably more conservative just in case there's a post Labor Day spike or just to make sure that things are trending the way they should. So I don't know, but it'll it'll be interesting because that park setup is much different. It is much smaller and it's a lot of annual pass holders, a lot of people within driving distance that could go often. So I'm really curious to know what like the park pass reservation system will be like and what capacity will be like and things like that. But I generally don't think that enough people are talking about how there are safer ways to visit the parks uh, in terms of not eating indoors, trying to not really eat much while you're there. If there's an indoor relaxation zone, not using that, not riding as many indoor attractions, which as an annual pass holder, I'm on a bit of a high horse with the ability to do that. But I do think that in terms of Disneyland, when it opens, I personally would probably treat it more like a actual park. I would probably go walk around, maybe do something outdoors, but um, not stay the whole day or make, you know, make a trip out of it. Yeah. And that's a good point about the annual pass holders, because I think about especially early on when they when you would see pictures of Disney World, it would just be so empty. And I know that's picked up a bit since that point. And I would be like, wow, I know that's not good, but that looks really Neat that it would be so empty because it rarely happens that way. But I think about Disneyland, like you mentioned, even on not the busiest day, certain areas get really congested, like Adventureland and even some other parts of the park. And then with all the annual pass holders wanting to just kind of swing by, man, I would not want to be the person having to keep the reservation system up because I feel like it's going to be one of those cases where things like it gets released and then it goes so quickly. It's, there's a lot of layers to it, which I think I'm sure that very smart people are exploring, but it, it could be challenging. Yeah. And to your point of, <laughs> of the low lines, I think when I came home, I tweeted something like uh, walking on Space Mountain doesn't feel so quick when you're stuck in the basement quarantining for two weeks like it's like the like eh, it's not so great um and that was when things were very extreme there but but yeah i'm i'm really curious just in like a i don't know like a curious scientific way to know how they're going to handle it because you know i i'm someone who pays for the what is, what is it called i have the the both coast one oh premier pass yeah the premier pass because like i can't i'm very bad at math and it feels better to me to buy that once a year than to have to spend like 130 dollars to get into the park to write a story like that just seems oh, i'm not gonna do that so i have that so i'm able to report on anything do anything on either coast whenever i have to and so like i technically am able to go to any park any day of the year and with that system, it's like, uh, <laughs> not exactly. And like, there's different levels of that for anyone who owns an annual pass now. So it'll be curious to see how that works. Yeah, if you ask me right now to explain the parks pass and how that works, especially for people with annual passes, I would fail miserably because I don't <laughs> know. But I even and I mean, just because I, I haven't gone. So it's easy to figure that out. So, um, well, it's going to be interesting, I have to say. And I'm... Um, I'm trying to stay optimistic right now, Carly. It's tough, but um, but I think, you know, I'm glad you got to visit the parks, though, because I think your article gave a lot of good information, just like you said, beyond just visiting some of the other elements, which have changed a lot, but I still think, I'll make sure to link in the show notes because I thought it was really helpful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it's really it's really so much more than just a few rides being open. Like it's, 
I mean, many are open. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble for that. Like it, there, there's a lot open. Uh, like there's so much more going on in terms of like the parks being open and how that affects the economy and how that affects so many people who need work, especially in Florida, because their unemployment system is terrible and pays out extremely little for like the lowest frequency of time nationwide. It's just so bad. And people have been furloughed or without work for so long. So it's like a constant battle back and forth of like, some things are good. Some things are challenging. Like you want people to not have to wait in hours long lines to get into food banks and like rely on that as much as so many people have been. It's just so hard because there's so many layers and it just, it all leads back to like government and economy, which typically reporting on theme parks doesn't. Well, it's hard to get around it. You mentioned this at the top of the show because, you know, it's hard to get around the fact that everything kind of goes up into a larger, larger thing and how everything's being run across the country, across states, California versus Florida, everything. But I think you did a good job reporting it. And just because it's, there's so much to it, basically. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It took a long time. <laughs> really, uh, really took one out of me. Um, but I, I'm, I'm glad I was able to do it. I'm glad I worked with uh, an outlet box with a V who were, were like very open to doing something this big and being able to like capture all these different aspects of it. And I'm, I don't know, I'm really interested for when Disneyland opens, especially because the things personally that really freaked me out about going to Disney world on a personal level, were flying and staying overnight. So being like, I am in another state, which seems strange right now. And Disneyland, because I live an hour away, like I, I would just drive there as though I was going to the Whole Foods. So it's it's a lot in pandemic times to be like, oh, that like it could just be a regular day for a lot of people instead of like a we are committing to going on a big vacation to Florida. Right. And that's the big challenge for a lot of people. Like, you know, I even think if like something like Disney World, Disneyland was in my city, it would be maybe a different consideration than, like you said, hotels and fast food and airplanes and everything else. It's just kind of mind blogging. And then I'm just like, no, I'm just going to go go sit here and um, I'm good. <laughs> but and being such a big fan, it's hard to make those decisions, though, for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And I have taken an approach of like, I'm not judging people for anything anymore because things have gotten very intense online. Mm. Um, I'm kind of like, if you're going to go to a park, as long as you wear a mask and you don't take it off for a photo, I, like we're good. <laughs> like It's fine. Um, I understand. Like also this year has been terrible. Um, I mean, it's, you shouldn't be traveling and like, you shouldn't be going to parks, but I'm not going to yell in a comment section like many other people have, especially now that the cases are somewhat less. But I mean, trust me, every thing, single thing I say I do uh, in my personal life, anything I say professionally, I'm always like thinking about, am I influencing someone to do something that could potentially harm them? It's like constantly in my mind, no matter what I'm doing. Oh, yeah. And that that makes total sense. Well, I think we should shift gears because... <laughs> oh, um, you don't want to talk about Doomsday anymore? <laughs> uh, you know, I, I try really overall in this show, try to kind of... And I wouldn't say like be overly positive. I want to be honest about stuff. But again, there's a point where I'm just like, I could just spiral out of control and like, you, you know, reading too much news or thinking too much about it. So I think we should answer some just random off the wall questions. Are you game for this? I am. All right. So let's ask these fun questions here um i don't know fun might be overselling it a little bit but let's see how it goes All it'll right. be fun it'll be fun <laughs> so since you haven't been to the parks as much what is the most random theme park food item that you have been missing okay so i really missed theme park popcorn but i feel like i was able to satiate that need because i would get a popcorn when i was at disney world and i would put it in a ziploc <laughs> this is a premeditated move and i would either like eat it in the car on the way home or like probably eat in my hotel room later so i had a lot of popcorn and i've been eating a lot of popcorn since but i do miss cheese sauce really badly like a good nacho cheese with like a gigantic soft pretzel because that's one that's not something i'm going to order for delivery and two you can't really just like run to a like a restaurant and get that that easily because if you're going to it's going to be like a fancy german pretzel it's not going to be like a ballpark pretzel 
So I really miss a pretzel with cheese, which they sell something similar at Sonic, which is like a soft pretzel stick with cheese. And so anytime I'm near a Sonic, I'm like, I got to get it. <laughs> and it, it, it does the job. Yeah, yeah, you're not. We're not thinking the um, the ten dollar Germany pretzel here. We're talking more of the like um, really good one you might get at a ballpark or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. Well, I, I like that because you know I get some at the store, but they're frozen, and then you you know it's not it's not the same. It's not I, the same. And I will also add that they opened the theater in town, which like not a chance I'm going there. Oh yeah. But I'm I'm like could I, if I go early in the day, there's no one in the lobby. Could I go buy popcorn and leave and not <laughs> encounter anyone? Like, is that if like take out, take out popcorn, maybe they'd let me. So I might have to investigate that. I think they'd probably let you <laughs> given how movie theaters are doing. They'd be like, what else do you want to do? You want a soda? <laughs> do you want anything else? Yeah. It's, it's so weird. All right. Well, here's an important question. So I know you've talked on your show about Olumel the oh, friend God. of Duffy. And, mm. you know, I went to Alani, but when I was there, they just, this was 2019, I was able to meet Duffy and Shelly May. Both had oh. very long lines. But I will say, so let's set Olu Mel aside. If you were going to rank, I recently learned about all these other friends of Duffy that I don't really know very much about, <laughs> but I would assume you might. So if you were going to rank these other friends of Duffy, how would you rank these four from one to four in terms of the like, coolest versus the one you like the least? Okay. And oh. I can give you stories if you don't remember who they are. I have opened up an article oh, that like, explains I don't, it. Please, please. <laughs> you don't think I know these people by heart? These are like my only friends. Um, I have a Stella Lou phone case and AirPod case. So like, <laughs> please, these are truly the only folks I'm hanging out with during quarantine. This is the um, most important question of the day, I would say, right off the oh. bat. God. Okay. I want to rank them because like as a reporter, I often rank things in terms of like reporter ranking where it's like, these are the best 10 rides, but that's like in terms of like objective public opinion. And then like my personal favorites. So my personal favorite is Gelatoni. He's my number one. Like he's my favorite. I carried him around when I went to Tokyo Disney Sea. He's the best. He is a cat. <laughs> he's <laughs> like paints with gelato. It's a whole thing. Uh, I love him so much. My second favorite. Oh God, I I think it might be Stella Lou, which is shocking because usually like Duffy's Duffy's at the top, so I'm like, oh, number three doesn't feel so high ranking. But yes, yeah, Stella Lou is really risen in the ranks for me because for a while I was like, I do not like her. And then there's all these other new random strangers. And I'm like, okay, well, she's kind of old school now. I like her. So number two, Stella Lou. Number three, Shelly May, because like she's Duffy's best friend. So like you got to keep her in the mix, even though I don't love her. She's just to me, she's like Duffy with a bow. I don't know. Uh, and then four, Cookie Ann, just because Cookie Ann's pretty new. Cookie Ann's like a year old, maybe. So she's still, she needs to earn her stripes, but I do like her. Yeah, and I don't really have a lot of thoughts about which I think is the best. I am confused, though. So Stella Lou, for example, she's yes. a hardworking girl with dreams of dancing on Broadway. What? I don't understand any of this. <laughs> just yeah, um, it makes me feel better that Chris, who runs TDR Explorer, also doesn't understand it because like he's the Tokyo guy and he's like, this backstory is weird. Um, but she was apparently like dancing and Duffy was like, wow. And then she was like, dreams are important. And he was like, oh, and now they're best friends. But I like her mostly because she's so differently shaped, which is so dumb. <laughs> but she has like these big, long ears. And so a lot of accessories with her just look different. So it's nice because usually like the Duffy, Shelly Mae, Gelatoni stuff will be like their head. And then with her, it's like her ears. So I think I just like her aesthetically. Okay, one last question about Duffy. So, you know, we watch, I've gone with my girls. They're now 11 and 7, but they were younger. We would watch that Duffy overnight story that they did forever on the TV. And then we got the book. So to me, Duffy's story about how Minnie created him for Mickey before he went a long voyage at sea is very strange. It, the whole thing is so odd to me. Just the idea that why is Mickey going on this long voyage? When did he become a sailor? Why is he getting a teddy bear? I don't understand it. So could you help me with this story? I unfortunately don't know how much clarity I can provide because a lot of the Duffy universe requires you to just go, 
okay. <laughs> because if you start asking questions, you'll be like, wait, Duffy and Shelly Mae aren't dating. They're just friends. And then you're like, they were truly like, like man created from rib. Like these two beings are meant to be together, but they're just friends. Like who will they find love with? It's, it's too much. It's too much to handle. So yeah, essentially Duffy's origin story is bizarro. It just doesn't, I think there's like two versions of his origin story too, which is like so much to handle. Yeah. It just, I, you gotta embrace how weird it is because like, Duffy met Gelatoni because Duffy spilled his gelato and Gelatoni was like, I'll paint a picture out of it. And now they're (laughs) best friends. Like you just have to, you just have to like let go of any brain processes and just like, let it wash over you. Doesn't make any sense, but we love them all anyway, except for Olu. Yeah. Except for, you know, people, people really love, love them more in Tokyo and overseas than here. Oh my God. It's so, it's so great there. It's so, when I, so I've been to Tokyo twice and I most recently went last winter and something I did not see the first time were children in like full Duffy outfits, like two year old, three year old little kids in hooded Duffy costumes. And then they would go take a photo with Duffy. Oh my God. It was <laughs> so cute. All right. Well, we'll move on from Duffy for now, but uh, oh, fine. <laughs> I guess we will <laughs> next time. Podcast just about Duffy. That I'm going to oh, do my research. Okay. The dream. So next question. Let's say there's a guest. Let's call him Dan. So let's <laughs> say he spent the morning riding Soren, living with the land, maybe saw Figment, and then had lunch at Sunshine Seasons. Would it be okay for Dan to then start at World Showcase in Canada, or do I have to go all the way over to Mexico because that's the law? I feel like if you're asking the question, you already know the answer, (laughs) which is that you go through Mexico, like you enter by Starbucks and you turn left, like you just turn left. It doesn't matter if you're all the way to the right. You still turn left. You still turn left. You still turn left. I don't know. I think it's a lot of extra walking. I don't know. I feel like I'm right there. I take that little path from imagination over there. But right there to what? Canada to Canada? What are you going to do in Canada? You know, there's that new movie. I guess I could watch that. I don't know. Not I mean, now. So, <laughs> In the future. Yeah, no, no. Please don't go inside. Yeah. Um, so like, okay. So an exception is if you are going to a destination. So I'm like, if you're go, if you're like, oh, I want to see that movie. Or if you're like, oh, I have a reservation at La Cellier. Or if you're like, oh, I'm picking up maple popcorn. Totally makes sense. Totally makes sense to me. If you are wandering, what are you doing? <laughs> go left. <laughs> go okay. left. Okay. I'm glad we cleared that up. All right. So, you know, some things have already been canceled. We've lost Mary Poppins. We've likely lost the Events Pavilion, probably the Reflections Resort. We've lost the entirety of the middle of Epcot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically we've lost a lot of things. So there are some things that we're not sure. Looking beyond all those, which of these D23 announcements do you think will never actually happen? The answer could be all of them. But of these <laughs> three, which will never happen? One, Moana Journey of Water. Two, a new film in China. A three, the Disney Genie. Oh, okay. This is a good question. Okay. So long responses. One, Moana. Pretty sure that has, like, this is all, and also I'm not reporting on this stuff right now, so I know nothing. This is right. just personal opinion. Uh, Moana seems like it is going to be cut and nobody will notice, honestly, because all of us were like, an attraction? And they were like, a fountain and we were like moving on like it's not what any Moana fan really wanted for Moana in the first place so I feel like that will go unless there is a Moana sequel no idea if there is or is not but I'm sure if they do a sequel that will probably be tied to that to come out because that's how those things work the second one was the China film that they they announced (laughs) it actually I think the D23 before the last one it's been a while the China film I I'm not sure because if they haven't shot it yet, it would be more advantageous for them to be pushing their own product because I know that there's, you know, there's like the film with that promotes Shanghai Disney resort. Mm. Like it would make sense for them to be like, look at this great thing we have there and kind of be pushing that because they need to increase like tourism to parks. So I would say maybe delayed just to promote that just because they already have that and they can be like, look how great Disney is easily because it's already in the can. 
I think that's true. I think um, I know there were some issues, I think, with um, beyond bu- bureaucratic government types things. But again, that's secondhand, so I couldn't say for sure. So the Disney Genie, what do you think about this Disney Genie? Are we ever going to hear about it again, or is it going to be like <laughs> the Main Street Theater or something else? <laughs> oh, RIP the Main Street Theater. I was <laughs> so excited for that. Um, I think Disney Genie will debut 2022. I feel like they had to announce something like that. You had to have already had all the tech approved and budgeted, in my opinion. Like, just taking a guess, if you're going to promote an entire new system, like, we know how intense these Disney systems are. So like something like that, especially that so deeply changes the way you book your trip and like pay for things, things like that, that had to have kind of been already approved, I assume. But you can't use Disney Genie while all of these other systems are in place. I don't, I think Disney Genie was, if I'm inferring from what I know globally, I, we all kind of knew that like paid fast pass was something that might be on the horizon Mm -hmm. because they already have the system in place at Shanghai Disney. Like, the genie thing kind of elevated it where, Oh, if you want to pay a little more for a curated experience and all of that language very clearly somewhat inferably mirrored what happens at Shanghai, where you can pay for a package of fast passes. So it's like, Oh, are you with a family pay X amount of money for these four fast passes? Oh, are you a thrill seeker pay this amount for these, which feels very Disney genie, but you're not going to see that while we have these very tight capacity restrictions, while we have park passes, things like that. So I think that Disney Genie will probably come online when crowds are back to normal, but I don't I don't anticipate them rolling out a new product like that that makes booking a Disney trip potentially more complicated until at least like end of 2021, 2022. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point too because um if the whole idea is it merges with fast pass, well, we don't have that right now or the dining plan. Well, you know, or whatever, we don't have those things. So it doesn't. doesn't Yeah. Yeah. If the, yeah. If the whole thing is predicated on getting reservations more easily so that you can just spend time living your life. I, I don't think it's, I don't think it can come online yet. Okay. Quick question. Yes or no. Will we see a significant update to spaceship earth in the next five years? No comment. (laughs) (laughs) Again, I'm not trying to like get inside info. This is more of a, um, this is just throwing things at the wall. I don't, I don't know if I can answer that. Oh, that's fine. We'll move on. (laughs) My, my response from someone who knows nothing, I will grab it is no, but we shall see. We shall see. That's my guess. (laughs) I will take over. Okay. Three more. If that works for you. Yeah. Um, so which of these will happen first? And again, this is just, will Disney finish the Grand Floridian walkway or and, and pr- announce it as open? Or will Universal actually announce the Jurassic Park coaster officially? <laughs> so I am going to guess that the walkway will open first, but there will be no announcement about it. There will just be like a random blog post. Uh, like everyone who is in Orlando will all know on the same day that it's opening. <laughs> and it'll be like unveiling of a concrete path. And we'll all be like, Oh my God, the path opened. And anyone who's not in this bubble will be like, what are you talking about? That's what I think is going to happen. And this coaster, it's become comical that like they have brought, they have not only dragged coaster track, through an open crowd like they've paused people in the park being like excuse me just have to bring in this coaster track and then also did that for a full dinosaur been like oh hold on like it's wrapped like a bike at christmas but like you don't know what it is like i just i i don't (laughs) i don't know what's i don't know what's happening there we all know we all know it's happening and it's so funny so i kind of hope they don't announce it until the day it's open because i'm getting much joy out of the daily updates from people being like there's that cool coaster that no one knows about and still no official comment. Yeah, it's it's really funny to me because, I mean, they kind of did this with Kong, but it was not on this level. It was I mean, this is a little I mean, there's Disney did it with Bay Lake Tower for a while, too. But this is like a different zone completely. This but is it's fun. I was I was watching Vincent Vision's video from when he was at Universal on Labor Day or Labor Day weekend. And he's standing under the track being like, I mean, walk- like, I'm in a walkway like the track is above my head. <laughs> <laughs> like it's you can't it's not even like behind a construction wall or you can see it from far away like you can see it from everywhere and you are underneath it it's just so funny i love it yeah it's i you know at some point in the future if they ever do their their next park that they've announced maybe they'll just build the whole park and they'll they'll only give really vague announcements and all of a sudden it'll be open they'll they'll like take this to the next level basically 
I, I think it's so funny. I, I think it's so funny. <laughs> okay. So which of these hotel names is the worst? One, Reflections, a Disney Lakeside Lodge. Two, Universal's Endless Summer Resort. Or three, the Walt Disney World Swan Reserve Hotel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they are all flawed. <laughs> and I will, yes. I, will, uh, I will explain why. Reflections sounds like an old people home because it's like, that's what they're always sound. It's always like, Oh, like reflect back on your life because now you live here in an assisted facility. Like that name seems bonkers to me. I understand it's to be like, we're near the water, but like, no, no, no. But apparently that hotel is done. So yeah. it, um, it collapsed in on itself. <laughs> I suppose universal's endless summer. Great idea, but confusing if it's not summertime, like I, I get the vibe and I really love what they've done with the hotel, but it's not like, uh, it's just, it's too much. If you're going there for like Halloween or like <laughs> It's Christmas always summer. Like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. It's just a little, it's a little too on the nose for me. And then there's the <laughs> Swan Reserve. So I publicly commended them for this name switch which happened recently because it makes it sound so much more elegant like i would pay 65 more dollars a night to stay at that hotel with that name it's so nice but here's what i discovered you can't google it you can't google it because when you google it all that comes up is oh would you like to reserve a room in the walt disney world swan (laughs) it's impossible to google it is like the most non-seo name ever to exist. So I love it. I love the vibe. I think it's very elegant and posh, but like good luck booking it. That's funny. As I look at like the way it's written. Yeah. It's like Swan reserve hotel. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if anyone's going to book it and then be like, wait, what? (laughs) But we'll see. The Cove was not a great name either. So that could have, that could have easily been on this list also. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Last one in a future world where we can visit the parks and things are more somewhat normal, which of these expansions, which I think all will still happen, are you most excited to see? So the three options are the Avengers Campus, the Tron Coaster, or the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel, assuming that still happens. I am very excited for Avengers Campus because, um, and granted, this is like, not exactly a current moment way I I would visit a park, but to me, it seems like a land that was created for how people visit DCA because a lot of times, like if you're a California adventurer, you are like a local, you're there with family, like you're there with friends, you hang out the way that that land is set up where it's just like, there's entertainment throughout the day, pop on by and see what happens. And then the food is like large formats. You can split it with friends. You can split it with family. Like it just seems designed for how people visit that park regionally. And I really love that as a local, that there's like a place to hang out and sit with friends or to like catch something or to walk through on the way to something else. Like it just is something that I would spend more time in personally. So I'm, I'm very excited for that also the spider-man ride looks great i'm very excited about it um but yeah no knock to the other two just for me in my spare time like that's where i'm gonna be hanging out no i think i would pick that one because i don't think i'll end up at the star cruiser hotel anytime soon given what it costs and tron i think will be awesome but yeah you bring up a good point about the Avengers campus because I think about two with most areas of Disneyland, you can't drink there. And so a lot of people might grab a beer and just kind of hang out and like, oh, wow, there's a robot stunt person flying over my head or something. I mean, how could that not be cool to be hanging out there and see all those things? Yeah. And I know that like the the second attraction is going to come online and like, um, who knows? Yeah. But like just in terms of the way that I find myself spending time in the park, you know, I would never really hang out in a bug's land. I'd maybe go on a ride for like a few giggles with a friend, but I wouldn't really like spend time there. And I think that having a space like that where, I mean, it's not, there's not like endless seating. I'm like making it sound like it's like a cafeteria, (laughs) but it's like a place where you can like grab a themed drink, like see something out of the corner of your eye while you're getting food, stuff like that. I think it'll be, it'll be really nice personally. Yeah, I mean, I think about, you know, 
why I love the Animal Kingdom so much. I would say, oh, they have good attractions, but I also just like being there when it's not super hot, but like hang out at night and everything, <laughs> where that's something that I appreciate more compared to, you know, attraction, attraction, go, 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 which is fun too, but not as much all the time. Well, this has been great, Carly. I know you're working on the podcast, but is there anything else you're working on right now that you can talk about or wh- how are things going looking forward? Things are good. I have my weekly sci-fi column, which is uh, where I report on all of the week's news. But I'm really, you know, I'm really all in with the podcast. We have a few very, (laughs) very interesting episodes coming up. I don't want to spoil anything, but basically like every week is just going to be something completely different. So if you're vaguely interested in theme parks, I recommend checking it out, seeing if there's any of the episodes that have already out that interest you and stay tuned for some other wacky things coming your way. Awesome. Well, where should people go to follow you and the podcast and the hundred thousand things that, that you've done <laughs> or will do in the future? Uh, my website that I never update. Um, <laughs> so you can find me at Carly Weisel on Twitter and Instagram. I am on there all day <laughs> because I no longer have a social life because I'm just sitting in a room every day. Um, you can find the podcast at very-amusing.com or wherever you get podcasts on Apple, on Spotify, on Stitcher, on all of the things. Uh, there's no social media for the podcast. So you have to, you know, look at a pale faced woman screaming about who knows what <laughs> to get the updates on it. But yeah, I'm, um, I'm on the internet all the time. Come say hi. Well, great. Well, this has been a lot of fun and, um, but thank you for indulging all my silly questions. At the oh end. my God. I love it. I love your podcast. Like you prepare, you have like very tailor-made interesting questions. I love it so much. I was so happy to be invited back. Oh, well, thank you. And um, you talked about kind of working through weekends and overdoing it. The preparation, I probably overdo a little bit, but I really appreciate the compliments. And thanks so much for being on the show. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Hopefully I'll just keep on coming back. Well, that was really fun. If you made it to the end of this podcast, let people know about it on social media. Use the hashtag Duffy Universe for this episode. And there are a lot more out there at TomorrowSociety.com with journalists like Carly and Valerie Moreno, former Imagineers like Tom K. Morris and Rick Rothschild, and so many more. I would love for you to hear those shows. If you'd like to support the podcast, you could become an official member of the Tomorrow Society through Patreon. To learn more, go to tomorrowsociety.com slash member and keep those ratings and reviews coming at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to this show. I love to know you're out there and it makes a huge difference in helping with the show. Of course, follow the podcast on Twitter at Tomorrow SOC, Facebook and Instagram at Tomorrow Society, and the YouTube channel at TomorrowSociety.com slash YouTube. The Tomorrow Society podcast is hosted, produced, and edited by Dan Heaton. The music was written by Adam Hookie and performed by the Sophisticated Babies. Next time I'm talking with Dan Cockrell, former vice president of Epcot and the Magic Kingdom, about his new book, How's the Culture in Your Kingdom? It was great to talk with Dan once again. Be safe out there, wear your masks, have fun, and I'll talk to you again very soon.